The views expressed, opinions given, and any communication made between the hosts and guests of What Are You Afraid of Horror and Paranormal Show do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Para-X Radio, EMC Network, or all services that play this show. The hosts and services are not responsible for the actions of their guests, and the original rights of all intellectual property is retained by the creator, and all work is used with either permission or Creative Commons license. The show is for entertainment purposes only. I'm horror author T. Fox Dunham. And I'm horror author and filmmaker Phil Thomas. And tonight we're asking you... What are you afraid of? Well, it's March, Phil. It is March. I know. And what is fast approaching? St. Patrick's Day. That's right. St. Patrick's Day has become more of an American Irish day. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or beer day. Yeah, it's an excuse to drink green beer and Irish whiskey. Or make Irish yeah. potatoes. I or do that. Corned beef and cabbage. Corned beef and cabbage. Oh, that's going in the crock pot this weekend. <laughs> oh, is it? You just you just called dinner. I just called dinner? I, did, I gave you an idea? <laughs> yeah, and I imagine you'll be recording on Tuesday, so I'll save you. Okay. Some corned beef and sure, cabbage. Sure, sure. You know, I do okay. like corned beef and cabbage, but this is episode 79. That's right, 79. The Fay. Ooh. Which we picked because it's easier for me to do the lettering. That's right. Because <laughs> <laughs> just the long titles kill. It's all me. about simplicity, right? Yeah. Sometimes you got to you got to manage yeah. your time. That's right. Yeah. You know, we do a show once a week. We do three a month for Para X and all the other radio services, and it's a bit, you know, it's a bit grueling at times. It can be, yeah. It can be. And we just yeah. did a wonderful interview with Carolyn Clapper. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Which will be on a, on our Psychic Summer. Right. The later shows that we're doing, we got mm-hmm. a video of that. Right. I know. So we were just talking about how great our hair looked. Yeah, yeah. She she really has nice hair. Yeah. yeah. And we we did we complimented her hair, so she knows that we think that. Yeah, um, I was jealous. Uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> was very. Fair. And you could tell that she, it was a video. It was a video interview, <laughs> so you could tell that she did do her hair. Yeah. For the uh, the video interview. But yeah, I wore a suit okay. jacket, even yeah. though I'm wearing jogging pants like under. <laughs> and I wore that. Uh, that wonderful Adidas uh, hoodie. Yeah, the Adidas hoodie. <laughs> yeah. That's like a trademark. Maybe though. I should have dressed up a little yeah. more. But yeah. We're fine. It's us. <laughs> yeah. You know, part of the reason people like us so much is that we are informal. Right. Yeah, That's true. You that's know, true. she was talking about other interviewers, and she wanted to talk to me first. And I can understand why, because people, especially the psychics, they bring them on their show not to talk to them, but because they want to get something out of them. They yeah. want to get a reaction out yeah. of them. Yeah. Like they want to be like, well, tell me something nobody else could have known and wow our audience, read their minds, you're like a mentalist or something. They don't actually want to talk to the person. And she was very delighted that we weren't pressing her for a reading. No, we weren't, no. We mm-hmm. just wanted to yeah. hear about who she was as a person. Yeah. It was a very good interview. Yeah, really nice questions you came up with too. Phil, Phil designed the interview on that one. So. Oh yeah, well, I, uh, I uh, came up with a couple good ones, mm-hmm. you know, and she, uh, she was very pleasant to talk to. She, she was, was very, very easy to talk yeah. to. Right. Very easy to talk to and a wonderful personality. Definitely. But but speaking of other wonderful personalities, for our Irish American episode, that's what I'm calling it. Okay. You know, for those yeah. of you who aren't Catholic or don't necessarily believe in in saints, you know, um, especially if you were from the Church of England and right around the time of Henry VIII, you would have gotten rid of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, okay, Reformation aside, so we're calling it Irish American Day. That's where basically what it is here, and we have brought back an old friend who was lovely, had some wonderful ghost stories. Cat Gash, how are you tonight? I'm fine. Uh, my book is My Life Amidst the Paranormal. I know, I keep wanting to call it My So-Called Paranormal Life <laughs> from the television show. <laughs> my So-Called Life. My so-called, my so-Called Paranormal Life. My So-Called yeah. Paranormal Life. So I just, I knew the title of your book, it just, like they say on Boston League, I have the mad cow. Fox just named your next book, so he just came out with the title, <gasps> My wonderful. So-Called yeah. Paranormal Life. And Trademark, what are you afraid of? <laughs> 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 but, 
<laughs> but we're, we're here today because you sent us two lovely stories that you got while you were over in Ireland. So we're, we're really lucky to have those. That's why we brought you back on, because you do a lot of travel writing in addition to your, your ghost story writing. And so we'll pause now to play the first of those stories, read beautifully by British folk singer David Walton. And this is Helping Hands on What Are You Afraid of? Horror and Paranormal Show on Parrots Radio Friday nights and on all major podcast services. Helping Hands, written by Kathy E. Gash, September 23rd, 2014. For my book, My Life Amidst the Paranormal, and published by Haunted Road Media. Read by David Walton. It was March of 1992 and my sister and I had been in Ireland visiting for almost a week. We had rented a car and had just left the town of Droida, north of Dublin. We already had an interesting morning, having locked the keys inside the rental car while we had been visiting Newgrange, to which we were so grateful to the tour guide there for letting us use a coat hanger to retrieve it. The weather was cold, rainy and windy, and with me behind the wheel, I was determined to make the most of this miserable day and find another interesting place to visit before we headed to our next bed and breakfast. Sitting alongside the road, we consulted our Fodor's tour guide book and came across a place called Slain Hill. Seeing that the area was associated with St. Patrick and not far up the road, I pulled onto the small road headed towards the site. I missed the turn off twice and was about to give up when my sister noticed a small sign pointing to the left and I almost turned the steering wheel off when she yelled, Turn here, now! I pulled onto a small gravel parking area with no other cars and we got out into the damp air. The area was dotted with ruins of a 16th century friary, a small cemetery, tall bell tower and a steep grassy area with more ruins. Having walked all around both sets of ruins, my sister was tired and thirsty and was about to head back to the car for a soft drink when I told her that I wanted to climb the bell tower for the view. She didn't like heights, so she said she would wait for me and walked over to the wall near the cemetery. The bell tower, part of the ruins of an earlier 15th century monastery, was intact enough to reach the top battlement so I set my feet on the first worn step to a long 60 foot climb. Although the winding stone steps were in relatively good shape, the walls were covered in moss and fungus from the constant dampness of Irish rain. With no railing to grip with my hands to keep from falling, I would lean forward, then put one hand on the step and the other on the right side of the wall to keep my balance. Like most ancient castles, keeps and towers, the stairs wind to the right. The reason is so that anyone defending, normally right-handed, would have more room to swing a blade going down the steps. The climbing was a slow process, as every now and then the steps would be slippery and a placement of my foot had to be precise or I would fall forward. My camera, on a strap around my neck, had a tendency to sway back and forth as I moved and more than a few times it banged against the wall. So I stopped, took it off and attempted to stuff it inside my coat without losing my balance. It was hard going but I've never been one to give up on a quest so onward and upward I went determined to find the top. I was more than halfway up when I came to a small window and looked out. Below was my sister walking around in the cemetery and I called out to her and waved. She yelled, Are you coming down now? To which I replied, Nope, I haven't even reached the top yet. She yelled she wanted to leave but I just kept going up. Another few tedious minutes later I arrived on the level where the bell would have been kept. There was no floor and you could see many feet below. 
What a horrid fall that would be if you lost your footing. Again I looked down, saw my sister, yelled, waved, then headed to the top level. Ten steps later I was finally at the top of the bell tower. There was only a ledge of about 18 inches of stone, with nothing in the middle, so I stood only at the top of the steps. Oh, the view from up there was incredible. I could see for many miles, and I understood why this area was such a strategic location for the kings of Tara, and why St. Patrick built a fire there. It would have been seen for quite a distance. Once again, I looked down to see my sister, took her picture, yelled that I was coming down, and turned to make what I knew was going to be a long, slow journey back down. What I thought was dangerous footing going up, now it was worse going down with nothing to hold on to. I had gone no more than a third of the way when I realised that I was coming to the worst section of the tower, with the stairs covered in slippery moss, so I braced myself and decided to go down one step at a time, on my butt. Yep, sit on the step, put your feet down, sit on the step, put your feet down, one step at a time. Tedious but safer, or at least I thought so. Every so many steps my rear end would slip, and I came down on the lower step with a thud. Ouch. I was almost to the bottom, and I could see daylight with no more than 15 steps to go. Feeling relieved to be at the end, I stood up and decided to walk down, upright. Big mistake. I had no sooner stood up when the heel of my right shoe slipped. My left leg buckled under me, and I felt my back hit the step hard. I could see the wall getting closer to my face, my balance completely gone. Just as I thought I was going to go down the remaining stairs on my back, someone grabbed my right elbow and left shoulder blade, and I stopped slipping. The touch was firm but gentle, and didn't let go until I managed to secure myself. Being so stunned that I was no longer falling, I looked behind me to see who it was that had caught me, but to my shock, there was no one there. I managed to get myself seated and checked for injuries. My hands were red from being scraped. My legs ached from being twisted and I could hear my heart beating through my ears. Catching my breath, I started shaking when I realised that I could have been seriously injured, with a long way to go for help. Somehow I managed to stand up but then decided it would be safer for me to go down the last few steps again on my butt. Just as I sat down, I heard the muffled sound of soft-soled shoes going up the steps behind me, and I looked around to see no one. Knowing that there was no way for anyone to be in the tower and get ahead of me in order to be behind me, I realised that the only explanation for what happened was that I had been caught by a ghost. I looked back up the stairs, still hearing the footsteps, and smiled. I finally reached the last step and walked, or rather limped my way out of the tower, and met up with my sister. After we got to the car, I told her that I had slipped and that I didn't think I should drive. At first she was angry with me for climbing the tower and getting injured. But when I explained that someone had grabbed me and prevented me from going ass over tin cups, she turned pale. She told me that after I yelled to her from the top of the tower, she had seen someone walking in the bell area below me. I told her that no one could have been walking on that level, there is no floor to walk on, but she insisted that she had seen someone wearing a hoodie and it bothered her that I wasn't alone up there. I tried to reassure her that no one else was in that tower with me, at least no one alive anyway. She just shook her head at me and said nothing. 
Even though my leg was hurting, I told her I would be right back and limped my way back to the tower. I stood at the bottom of the steps and called out, Thank you, you may have saved my life. As I turned to walk away, I could have sworn that I heard someone say something, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. Was it Old Gaelic? Was it Latin? Who knows? All I know is that they acknowledged my gratitude. My sister reluctantly got behind the wheel and turned onto the main road, and though I was in pain and still shaken by the fall, I smiled at this wonderful experience. You see, even though the friary has been abandoned since the early 1700s, I truly believe that some kindly friar or monk still roams the grounds, taking their duties to heart and lending a helping hand to those in need. I'm Jenna Valadez with The Basement Files. Tune in Friday nights, 6 p.m. Central, 7 p.m. Eastern, right here on the Para-X Radio Network. Caliber and Press LLC is a Madison, Wisconsin-based publishing company owned and operated by Alan Ledden. Caliber and works with talented writers, artists, editors, and marketers throughout the United States, and you can find their books through their many imprints that include Damnation Books, Eternal Press, Malafuria Press, Ciento Sordida Publishing, and Spiro Publishing. Please visit their website at sites.google.com forward slash site forward slash Caliburn Press LLC forward slash home or Google Caliburn Press to check out their growing list of titles on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, and any other place fine books are sold. My name is David Walton. I am a vocal performer for What Are You Afraid Of? Horror and Paranormal Show. And I have carried the burden of a terrible secret. I am actually what is offensively called a ghost. For years now, I have concealed my ectoplasmic existence from my friends and family in fear of a common prejudice against ghosts or what we like to call the disembodied. I have existed frightened of being discovered, unable to do physical acts that the embodied take for granted, such as walking a squirrel or drinking a glass of vitamin E milk fresh squeezed from a whale. I grew depressed and even considered acts of self-harm or reincarnation, which is suicide for the disembodied. Such movies as Ghostbusters and its sequels drove my feelings of disenfranchisement and I began looking for help only to encounter painful exorcisms in the houses I haunted. Then, I met two good people, it says here, Fox and Phil, at What Are You Afraid Of? Horror and Paranormal and they help me take control of my own life. Now, it is my choice whether I wish to make phantom bangs in the night, appear at the foot of your bed in darkness, or make your walls bleed. If you are a disembodied person like I am, and you're living a lie, what are you afraid of can help you too. They are on at 9pm on Friday nights at Para-X Radio, leaving plenty of time for midnight haunting activities and can be found on all major podcast services. Listen to their paranormal stories, interviews, humorous sketches and horror fiction to know that you are not alone. And if you are a member of the Embodied, don't forget... You are only a single heart attack or tumour away from becoming one of us. This is David Walton. See you on the other side. Or as I call it, this side. And that is the end of a perfect day. Thank <laughs> you.
Your source for everything paranormal. Para X. We are back We're with back. What Are You Afraid Of? That was great. Yeah. That was a wonderful story. Something I've always said about Cat Gash is that she not only writes these charming ghost stories, she also writes about the places she's been to. And often the setting is dancing with the ghost story itself. And as, as we all, as we both know as authors, all of us as authors, uh, especially with ghost stories and, and horror stories, setting is so intricate. Mm, yeah, exactly. Especially with the, the folklore in nature. So tell us a little bit about Helping Hands. Where were you? What was happening when you had that experience? Well, I was on my first trip to Ireland with my sister in 1992. And we drove ourselves, as we generally do. Uh, every time I've been there, I've driven myself. I've never gone on an organized tour. And we had left uh, Newgrange, the burial mound area outside of Dublin. And we were headed to our next bed and breakfast, and we saw this little sign that said Slane Hill. And I looked it up in the guidebook. It just spoke of it being ruins uh, and quite possibly where St. Patrick had been mm. at some point. Mm. They had lit huge bonfires up on the top of the one hill in order to let everyone know that the locals had won the local battles from the local warlords. And so it had a great significance. Now, while it's nothing but ruins, you can still walk around everywhere. And one notable place here is a bell tower. Now, my sister was afraid of heights, so she really didn't like to go up onto high floors or into buildings that were way too high. But me, you know, I'm game for just about anything. I'll go into caves, <laughs> up and down stairs. And so I took it upon myself to go up into this uh, bell tower. Now, being ruins, the interior of this bell tower had been exposed to the elements for so long that the walls were kind of wet from rain and dew. There was a combination of moss and even mold all along the interior. And typical winding staircase going up to the top, I had to go up very, very carefully. There was no railings, no ropes or anything to hold on to. And I got all the way to the top, gorgeous view from up there. And I looked down and there was my sister standing Below, I took my picture of her from above. She took my picture from below. Hmm. So it was kind of an interesting perspective. But I kind of got the feeling that I wasn't alone up there. And I kept looking around, thinking, well, we didn't see anybody else drive up. Our car was the only one there. And my sister wasn't about to come up. I could still see her. But I could definitely tell that there was somebody there with me in that bell tower. And... I walked all the way up to the very top where the bell would have stood, and that area was gone. It must have been a wooden floor at, at some point, but it was gone. So you, I didn't walk all the way in there because it was kind of dangerous. But I turned around to come back, and back then, we didn't have the small digital cameras that we do nowadays. I had a big old clunky film camera that was on a strap around my neck. So it was around my neck. And I'm starting to walk down those winding stairs, holding on to both sides, and my camera's walking back and forth and everything. And I'm like two-thirds of the way down, and suddenly my feet come out from underneath me. And it bent my one leg under. I smacked my elbows. I skinned my fingers. And then suddenly I felt somebody grab me from behind. Mm -hmm. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, well, but he he grabbed me by the arms, though. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, yeah. that was the one place that he grabbed me. Or at least I, I'm assuming it was a he because it was fairly strong. But it was enough that it prevented me from sliding down the rest of the stairs. I mean, I could have been seriously injured. Being that far away from the nearest town, um, it would have been something for my sister to, to get me to, you know, a hospital or anything. But about the time that I steadied myself. I, I felt whoever it was let me go. And I turned around to look and all I could see was a small vague shadow going up around the turn on that winding staircase. I started to come back down and I was sore and a little bit upset that I had lost my footing. But I turned around and I said thank you to whoever it was that 
prevented me from falling. And when I finally got outside and met up with my sister, I told her what had happened, that I'd fallen. And she said, are you all right? And I said, well, I'm sore. You know, I banged myself up. I was limping a little bit. And she said, I was getting a little worried because there was somebody up there with you. And I'm like, no, there wasn't anybody up there with me. What are you talking about? And she said, well, just about the time that she could see me in the bell tower area, right after I went out of her view, somebody else showed up and she described it as somebody wearing a hoodie, you know, a, a jacket with a hood on it. So then they disappeared also. And I thought, well, there's no way. No, nobody could have come up those stairs without my seeing them. And nobody could have been on that bell platform with me at the same time or anywhere close to that same time. And if somebody had come up the stairs after I did, I would have seen them. I would have heard them. And then it occurred to me, oh, wow, whoever it was that caught me wasn't real. They they, they really weren't there. Right. No, no material. No, they were not material at all. So even though my leg was bothering me, I went back and I stood at the bottom of the stairs and I looked up and I said, Thank you so very much. And I could hear footsteps, very, very soft footsteps going up the stairs. And it it just made me feel good that somebody prevented me from having a serious injury. I mean, I really could have gone nose over ten cups mm-hmm. at that right. point. But they, they stopped me. That's good. It was, it was yeah. fantastic. Right. Well, it might have been a previous landowner, and he yeah. probably didn't want to get sued. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're still in, you know, survival yeah. mode, right? Yeah. <laughs> Don't get sued. A lot of American coming <laughs> over and <laughs> breaking their neck on my land. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's incredible. Yeah. But Phil, have you been to Ireland? I've never been to Ireland. You never been to Ireland? No. Do you ever want to go? I've been to. Your, oh yeah, I definitely want to go. Mm-hmm. You've been love, to Europe. I would you love, said. Yes, I have. Okay. I would love to get. Uh, I've been to London. I've been to mm-hmm. Paris, oh. France. Have you really? Uh, I've been to Normandy Beach, which was great. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Don't walk. Uh, don't don't stray from paths because you can still blow yourself up. Really? That's what they told us. Yeah. Oh wow. Because mm-hmm. yeah, there's still live landmines out right. there. Right. I guess uh, they haven't gotten be. them all. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I've been to Europe, so I would love to get to Ireland though. We. Probably. You remember my honeymoon? We had a trifecta honeymoon. We were married in Scotland in Edinburgh, and then we flew from Edinburgh to Dublin. Mm. Which, if I had known Dublin, Dublin isn't the best tourist attraction. Like, it, no. it's better to go to um, the coastal areas. Okay. You know, which is what we did. We, we we spent the first night in Dublin, and it rained harder than I've ever seen it rain in the States. I mean, we were so um, head to toe. I actually bought an umbrella which was a stupid, stupid tourist thing to do, because when I did it, the staff were looking at me with this, okay, give me your money, that's fine. <laughs> and we found out why, because when we took the umbrella out, it was destroyed oh. within minutes. Really? The wind and rain was <laughs> so bad. Wow. So we just huddled back to the bed and breakfast we were staying out of, it was a, a tenement house. We had a nice little room, big room, and we were soaked and didn't have any clothes really to wear. For that time, because they were, we were, we had to pack light. We went to Scotland and got married there, so, mm-hmm. and so we took all of our clothes, most except for our pajamas, and, and put them out in front of the heater to dry. And then we ordered Indian food from the place next door mm-hmm. and ate it out of the tea set, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, which is fun. <laughs> but nice. remember, I had that experience that night where I was lying in bed with my wife and I heard the door open, and I didn't think I thought it was out in the hall. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then I heard footsteps, and I thought that was out in the hall. I was very tired, very wet. And then someone actually leaned on the side of the bed. Oh, wow. And I twisted around like, you know, are we sharing a room? <laughs> <laughs> There's and something else in here. There was no one there. The door was locked. How old was the place? Oh, it was a couple hundred years old. Okay. okay. I'll find pictures. Okay, I'll find yeah, pictures online yeah. where, where they're easily findable by anybody who wants to know I was married in Scotland. You know, the beautiful mm-hmm. pictures we took, um, got a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Mm. But, yeah, so, and I, and I sort of, you know, I've talked about my wife before. She's so nonchalant when it comes to the paranormal. You know, I, I said, "Hun, I think a ghost just came, and I think they just pushed down the bed." And she's <laughs> like, "Where are they gone?" I'm like, "Well, I hope so." I, I know. So she's like, "Okay, I'm tired. I'm going back to bed." That's her. She believes in the supernatural, and she treats them like the living. 
<laughs> you know, kind of like, oh, you're dead, don't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're alive, don't bother me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's very my wife. She's just, you know, oh, there's a ghost here. Um, can they come back later? <laughs> so That's funny. You definitely need to get Ireland, and you need really need to get there soon. Um, it's unfortunate that, like a lot of places that uh, are considered borderline tourist mm -hmm, type right. of places ireland is a great tourist country uh in so much as that there are so many things to do and see however old ireland the way most people think of it is kind of leaving mm. uh, it's unfortunate that they are a country just like any yeah. place else where the, a lot of these cities are getting very built up Mm -hmm. You know, there's new housing complexes. Yes, they want modern conveniences. Right. Yeah. Yes, uh, and it's also very unfortunate that um, my last trip that was there in 2006, some of the smaller towns that I had seen when I was there with my sister in 92 and then again with my niece in 98, um, some of those towns were totally unrecognizable because right. of all the housing that was built. So the commercials that you see of Ireland with people on horseback, running up and down the shoreline or over beautiful green mm -hmm. fields and hills and everything. Yes, there's absolutely breathtaking places there. There's no doubt about it. But unfortunately, a lot of the old quaint towns are no longer that way. Uh, the newer generations are not wanting to farm the land. Mm -hmm. They want jobs. They want good-paying jobs in towns. So the larger pieces of land that are normally used for crops and for livestock are being taken over by larger, I, I wouldn't say corporations, but conglomerates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And quite a number of the castles are taken over by foreigners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Because they're the, they're the only ones that have the money Who can to be able them? to put into it. Yeah. My, my family has um, actually pretty close generational. We had property of a Sco of a Scottish castle called Wedderburn, and up for hundreds of years, generations, the Hume family were living there. I mean, up until like the seventies, and it became impossible to live there. The upkeep, the back taxes, mm. the heating. Um, just the maintenance on the property was impossible, so eventually they sold the castle, they sold the grounds to a corporation, and they turned it into a tourist attraction. It was yeah. the only way, and they, they were all, you know, people are, oh, you live in a castle, it's so wonderful, <laughs> and they were like, again, you bloody yank, you want to live here? This is awful. <laughs> you know, we, we get sick all the time, right, and, the pl right. and the plumbing is all gravity toilets, you got to go upstairs to... The castle's out of the family name. It's now a bed and breakfast, and more power to them. Who wants that? Right. Yeah. Yes. I, I agree. I know what you mean. But like, like you're saying, when we went to Dublin, we were, again, the ignorant American expectation of, of <laughs> Ireland. You know, we went over expecting this magical city, you know, and it is very magical if you look at it. But you have to look at it from another point of view. And, and yet, as we're, you know, on the tram and enjoying the city, it was a lot like visiting North Philadelphia. Okay. Really? Yeah, it was. North Philadelphia. Yeah, really. Boston, yeah. Or, yeah. you know, but there were, I think what I really. I love Boston. I love the revolution mm -hmm, right. against the English. If you walk down, you see all the streets in Dublin are named after different revolutionary figures like Michael Collins or Eamon de Valera or, mm -hmm. you know, from the 1916 Finian. Right, right. <laughs> well, we have a song that I actually found this song in Gettysburg when we were there. Oh, back in September. Yeah, back in September yeah. when we, we recorded that show. And we got permission to use the song. I was in their Irish store in okay. Gettysburg. Yeah. And this is, it's, it's, it's a sort of sad traditional ghost story um, sung by a group called Comerant's Fancy. And I, I say that, I'm probably mispronouncing it because it's, they've written it in the English and the Gaelic would have H's and G's and H's in it probably. <laughs> it's Margaret Folkemere, Richard Cesar, Beth Folkemere, Stephen Folkemere and Chuck Cripley. So the Folkemere is the Cripleys and the Czars. Mm. We're going to have links up on the website, but we'll pause now. And this is Sad Courtings on What Are You Afraid of? Horror and Paranormal Show with Cat Gash, episode 79. It's a old and a wealthy man. He had a daughter, her name was Anne. She were handsome, fine and tall. She had a loving face withal. 
Sing, lady, lady, lady fair, many's the suitor had she there, a widow son of a low degree, among them all she fancied he. Sing, cordon, cordon, cordon came, there's many a courtship all in vain. For when her father came to know, he sent her far, oh, far from home. One night, as she were lying down, the quiet loosening of her gown, she heard low and a deathly sound says, Loose my bonds, I'm earthly bound. She looked out of her window clear. She saw in love on her father's mare. Here's your mother's cloak. Here's your father's robe. I've come near love for to take you home. He's mounted up. She's on behind. And they rode on with contented mind. But all along complaint he makes says, Love, oh love, my head do ache. Her handkerchief from her neck around, she bound it round his head around. He set her down at her father's door then. Her true love she saw no more. Awake, 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 cried she. Is there no one here for to welcome me? You're welcome home, dear child, says he. But what trusty friend did come for thee? Did you not send one I do adore? That love so dear, but must love no more. Her father frowned, and he shook his head. Says, your true love been one year dead. He summoned clerk and clergy too. That grave was open, and him to view. And though he had been a twelve month dead, her handkerchief was wound round his head. So a warning to you old folks still, don't hinder young ones from their will. The first they love, they'll never forget. No, he be dead, she'll love him yet. What happens to a ghost when their home is torn down? No one thinks of the disembodied when they rip down old buildings, dig up cemeteries, and build clean, unhauntable condos. Every year, hundreds of spirits are driven out of their own haunts by the careless living to exist alone with no one to scare. At Para-X Radio, our hosts feel the plight of these evicted disembodied and are reaching out to you to please open your heart to one of these lost souls, such as the ghost soldier of the General Wayne Inn or the abandoned spirit cat of Benjamin Rush. So please, please, let a little spooky into your life. Won't you open your house to a ghost without a home? Para X. Mercy, a new horror medical thriller from author T. Fox Dunham, published by Bloodbound Books. Based on the author's horrific battle with a rare form of lymphoma that involved intense chemotherapy and radiation, Fox turns the horror of his experience into terror on the page. William Sane is dying of cancer. On most days, death seems like a humane alternative to the treatment. Stricken with fever, William is rushed to mercy. Notorious is a place to send the sickest of the poor and uninsured to be forgotten, and finds the hospital in even worse condition than his previous visit. Willie's memories faded. He grabbed his sack head, the sack head of the scarecrow, picking up the exposed chicken wire to hold them in. However, the memories fell out of the holes in his face. They wormed and crawled from the leather flesh and the old clothing of the scarecrow. 
then squirmed and wiggled down his body. The grounds are unkempt, the foundation is cracking, and like the wild mushrooms sprouting from the fissures of decay around it, something is growing inside the hospital. Something dark. Fangoria gives Mercy 3.5 out of 4 skulls. Dunham has channeled his many brushes with the other side into the exquisitely rendered lyrical supernatural hospital thriller Mercy. It's feeding on the sickness and sustaining itself on the staff, changing them, and now it wants Willie. Come now, Mr. Saint. Just a little more of that sweet mail. Mm-mm-mm. So salty and so good. You won't miss it. And we ever do so like our delicacies here at Mercy Hospital. Part medical horror, part supernatural suspense, Mercy is a hard-hitting fever dream of a novel. I enjoyed the hell out of it. Tim Wagner, author of The Way of All Flesh and Eat the Night. Available from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and bookstores everywhere in both print and digital versions. Life is an addiction. Let go. Let it all burn. You're listening to the Electronic Media Collective Podcast Network. Yeah, it's a mouthful. For more great shows, visit electronicmediacollective.com. Very mournful song. Yeah. That was. It's, it's, was. it's not like the upbeat stuff we usually do. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, because we always do upbeat yeah. stuff on, yeah, we on the show. We do. And, and this, this Saturday is St. Patrick's Day. Yes, it is. As you, as you know, and as mm-hmm. everyone knows, have you been doing anything to get yourself in the spirit? Have you been reading any kind of Irish folklore or listening to any kind of music or... Yeah, well, I always listen to this. Watching yeah. the Leprechaun Marathon movies or something? Are there, there is not. <laughs> really? <laughs> no. Marathoning the Leprechaun movies? Look at the little guy <laughs> running around going, I want me gold. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In space I think it was, it was Warwick Davis. Warwick Davis, yeah. yeah. <laughs> who, who was Willow. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then he became the Leprechaun guy right, who was right. killing teens at the <laughs> lake. And Jennifer and... Aniston was in the first one. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, she was. But, but uh, you've been doing some stuff to get in the spirit? I have. I've been reading some of the Irish folk tales mm-hmm. and listening to the Dubliners quite Quite a bit. Like, oh, I love the Dubliners. One of my favorite Irish bands. Oh, yeah. you like the Dubliners? I love them. They're one of my favorites. Do you like yeah. the Chieftains? I like them too, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Mm-hmm. I love them, yeah. But we, we are back with Cat Gash. I'm sorry, where are you from? I'm again? in Maryland. You're in Maryland. You're near Maryland. Hagerstown, that's right, because you go up to Gettysburg. But you're near Long Antietam. Time. Yeah. Antietam, yeah. Closer to place. Antietam, but I'm, I'm about halfway in between Antietam and Gettysburg. So it's a little further to Gettysburg, but... I guess I can kind of look at it that way, that I'm, I'm sandwiched in between two major battles. Well, that's cool that you kind of like right in between them. You can yeah. have your pick. Which one am I going to go to, you know? So you've been I, reading about the Fae. I have. The fairies. Yeah, 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 I have, yeah. And the, the Puka. The Puka. The Puka. Yeah, we were talking about this earlier. He's, he's the, yeah, um, he's a little goblin shaped like a horse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just reading about that in my little, my little Irish folk tales. And, uh, yeah, it was the first time I ever read it. Mm-hmm. I never really read it before. Was that the Yeats version? Like the Yeats Legends and William Butler Yeats wrote a great collection. It was that, yeah. It was Yeats, it was yeah, because you can usually find that at Barnes & Noble. Right. Pretty right. I have a nice collection of folklore. You have one too? Upstairs, yeah. And yeah. i got to give you some names of some great Irish bands. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know, that'd be great. Yeah. Be nice. I, mean, I mean, Dubliners are one of my favorites. And, the Dubliners are wonderful. Yeah, yeah, there's that great traditional Irish pub music. And a bit on the harder edge, you got the Dropkick Murphys. Dropkick Murphys, sure. <laughs> and, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. A little and, more um, punk rock or whatever. Not punk rock, but a little more rock. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're pretty, pretty cool. fun. So, now, Cat, besides ghosts, it feels like that you've also seen some fey creatures, the she, as we call them, uh, S-I-D-H-E, as in, um, to give our audience an idea, like, you've all heard of the Banshee, mm-hmm. you know, the, the nocturnal morning spirit usually come before someone dies, and she would come wailing in the night keening. But if you look at the name, it's been Americanized, B-A-N-S-H-E-E, but it's actually B-A-N, bad, or night, you know, there's a connotation there, and then S-I-D-H-E, she as in fae, so it's ban she mm, and she, which is the old word for fairy. Right, ban she Or mm-hmm. fae. So, you've seen some fae yourself, apparently. Yes, I have. I didn't know that I did at the time. Which is kind of unusual because I'm generally open-minded to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And going to Ireland, the first thing that people ask me when I get back was, did you see any leprechauns? (laughs) And I'm like, if I did, I probably wouldn't have recognized them because they supposedly don't like to be recognized for what they are. Mm -hmm. They take another form. So when I had this experience... um, 
when I was in Ireland for the first time with my sister, I had no clue what it was. All I knew is it was not something normal. This was not something that I would have encountered, I think, anywhere else. And, of course, being a cat person, not only is my name cat, but I, <laughs> I love cats, felines. Right. I can spot them anywhere. I can mm. spot them in a field, in an apartment. I can spot them on a fence, you know, are anywhere your, I go. Favorite, there's a cat, there's a cat. Are they your favorite and, animal? Is that, is that your favorite animal? Spirit guide? Spirit animal guide? Yes, yeah. yes, they're okay. my favorite animal. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so when my sister and I went, we were in a small town called Kilorglin, which is in County Kerry. My sister and I had gone approximately two blocks to a local pub. And right after we had left the bed and breakfast, I spotted a a cat. I see cats everywhere. And this happened to be what I would refer to as a tortoise shell. And that's the, the, the blackish cat that has the orange and the brown and the, you know, cream color and everything on it and it was sitting across the street and it was just staring at us and I automatically my first reaction is to say hey kitty kitty you know Mm -hmm. how are you it didn't pay any much attention to me it just watched and then a short distance later there it was again but it was just sitting there and I, I thought wow you know this cat is following us but I noticed that it had weird color eyes it was not the typical eyeball shine or the green eye shine that you see in animals in the dark. And there really wasn't a whole lot of lights. There were a, a, a few street lights that were there because there were some small houses along the way. But there really wasn't a great deal of light. And I thought this was strange that this cat had this eye shine when there was no light. So I just kept looking at it and looking at it. Just a short distance later, there it was again. But this time it was across the street, and it was ahead of us. And I was thinking, how in the world did this cat get ahead of us across the street without us knowing it? And it didn't act like it was winded or anything like that, and it was pretty much sitting in the same position that the first time that I saw it. Now, I kept thinking, well, wow, is this some sort of lawn ornament, <laughs> you know, that's got you know, glowing eyeballs that mm-hmm. all of these people have in their yard. Sounds tacky. Because it was so strange. Yeah, it was weird. I left the sidewalk and headed toward it, and it started to get up and move away. And I thought, okay, well, I'm not going to freak you out. You know, I'm not going to approach you if you don't want me to. But then it stopped, and it looked at me, and I just stared at it for a few moments, and then it kind of blinked, and then it just stayed there and then it backed up i mean and it didn't literally turn around and walk it, it just kind of like backed up and faded into the dark i'm like wait a minute this is definitely weird mm. because you could see the area where it was sitting and there was nowhere for it to go but it was gone so i told my sister about it and she wasn't real concerned she was more concerned about getting something to eat and actually so was i mm. But I kept thinking about the fact that this cat's eyes had this weird glow everywhere that it went. It didn't make make any difference if it was near the street light or anything. This cat's eyeballs were just glowing strange. Mm -hmm. So when I got home, I kept thinking about what it may may have been. I, I had no clue what it may have been. And I started reading various different things about the fae. And it occurred to me that maybe this is what I saw. Mm -hmm. And I got in touch with some friends of mine who had, well, they had claims of seeing what you would refer to as elementals. Right. Fairies, fae or she or whatever. And finally, one person in particular told me, yes, you definitely saw a fae and... They appear to you in a form that not only you could associate with, but something that you trust and feel comfortable with. And right. that's cat. I've had yeah. fae experiences before. Yeah. You do a lot of gardening, you open your third eye, you eventually see them on rivers, and, and they're part of every folklore tradition, always the little ones, the golden ones, the tua de danu, the, the fairies, the fae, the she. And I had no idea. And I asked this person, I said, well, why, why at that particular time did 
this particular fade decide to show itself to me? And what was the reasoning behind it? It's just been the right because time. I knew yeah. it wasn't a typical cat. And they told me that more than likely, this particular fay had attached itself to me, not only because of the familiarity I had with cats, but it was their way of saying, you know, we have a connection. I'm going to look out for you while you're here. Well, that's nice. Yeah, very yeah. nice. It was odd because I didn't think about it at the time, but until this person told me this, every moment that my sister and I were there, it seemed like we were always about to get into a car accident. Hmm. I mean, between not being familiar with the roads, driving on the wrong side of the road, or, excuse me, the, <laughs> the other side of the, other the road. Side of the road. Yeah. Wrong side for us, right? Yeah. Yeah, right yeah. side for them. And almost got into a number of car accidents, whether it was because we inadvertently made a wrong turn hmm. into oncoming traffic, um, we almost sideswiped cars because we couldn't gauge how far we were from another car. Mm-hmm. We took wrong turns into oncoming traffic. We almost hit donkeys, sheep, mm-hmm. cows, and Connemara ponies along the way. And it was odd that every time we almost got into an accident, something stopped us right then and there. It was like, no, you can't go any further. No. You shouldn't go any further. Something stopped, and all the other cars, all the other animals just kind of went around us. So it made sense. To me, it made sense. Something was looking out for us. That definitely sounds like it. Yeah. Come to Ireland, get a fae. <laughs> you can rent our cars, get our fae. Will. <laughs> well, Kat, it's been wonderful talking to you. Your book is called My Life Amidst the Paranormal. It is available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and through Haunted Road Media. And if you want a signed copy from me, uh, you can contact Haunted Road Media, and my publisher will let me know, and I will send you one. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's great. Wonderful. Thanks yeah. for talking to us. Thank you, Kat. And we hope you have a Thank happy St. Patrick's Day. Oh, most certainly. I intend on imbibing on Friday and Saturday both. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Well, well, this has been fun. Yeah, definitely fun. Enjoy yeah. your green beer. I, I will. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This is Slancha. Steve Fox Dunham. Slancha. Slancha, yes, yes. Are you going to be drinking green beer? Uh, no, actually, I, that kind of puts me off. <laughs> I, 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 I know what you mean, yeah. <laughs> I can't do it. Yeah, it, it's it's just it's just a bunch of food coloring. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. You're basically dying your insides green. So it's, it's, yeah, that's it. That and your, and your teeth. <laughs> and that too, yes. <laughs> well, Great. this has been a wonderful show. Tapi la, Kat. And I'm Tupac Thank Dunham. you. And I'm Phil Thomas. Fairy Feline, written by Kathy E. Gash, September 23rd, 2014. For my book, My Life Amidst the Paranormal, published by Haunted Road Media, and read by David Walton. March 1992. Only a few days into a driving trip through the Republic of Ireland with my sister, and we were so looking forward to going out for the evening to experience some of the local pubs for dinner and drinks. After having checked into our bed and breakfast in a small but cosy house in the small town of Kilorglin outside Killarney, we decided to walk the three blocks to a pub restaurant that we had seen on our way into town. The walkway from our B&B was illuminated only by a dim outside porch light, so we had to be careful of going down the four steps to the sidewalk heading into town. The town of Kilorglin had streets barely wide enough for two cars, and was lit with short antique looking street lamps that gave off a dim yellow light, which gave the town a very odd appearance. Neatly maintained row houses lined both sides of the road, with tiny yards all separated by either stone or iron fences. The pub we wanted to visit was on the opposite side of the road, but we decided to walk on the side with the street lights. There was a chill in the air, so we started our walk at a rather fast pace, anticipating a hot meal and drinks at the end of our journey. 
Being a cat lover, I notice cats wherever I go, along the road, in windows, in yards, and if the cat is within touching distance, I will always attempt to make friends. So, when I spotted what appeared to be a rather large cat in the yard beside the B&B, I stopped briefly to say, hello. At first, all I could see was its outline, but my eyes adjusted to the dark and could see the lovely black, tan and brown markings of a tortoiseshell. But I couldn't see her eyes, so I assumed they were closed. Just as I started to walk away, the eyes opened, and I was puzzled when I noticed that the eyes didn't have the typical green eye shine that most cats have. Instead, it had an odd glow of reddish gold. I thought at first that maybe it was an ornamental statue in the yard, and not a real cat after all. My sister, a few yards ahead of me, motioned for me to catch up, so off I went. A few more houses away, and I spotted another feline in the yard. It had the same shape and colour as the one I saw earlier, so I said, Wow! People around here really like tortoiseshell cats. It was sitting in a different position, but once again I didn't see the eyes until I stopped to say something. Again, the eyes glowed reddish gold and not green. So, two people have the same lawn ornament. That had to be it, right? Again, I trotted off after my sister and I'd gone no more than three houses down when I spotted yet another cat in the yard across the street. Determined to find out if I was either seeing live cats, or if someone was making a profit from selling cat statues to everyone in town, I told my sister that we should cross the street there, and I headed for the yard. Because that side of the road had no street lamps, this yard was even darker, but I could still see this cat, with its tortoiseshell markings, sitting on the stone fence only a few yards away. I got as close to the gate as I could when the eyes opened. This time, the eyes blinked at me twice, and I could see the tail swinging back and forth. Okay, so if this is an ornament, they did a very good job with animation. If it were actually a real cat, how could it get ahead of us without our seeing it and especially crossing the street? It had to be an ornament. Just as I was about to walk away, something caused me to jump. The cat had jumped off the wall and was coming towards me and the eyes had changed from the reddish glow to a dark blue. So it wasn't an ornament after all. I called out my usual, Hey, kitty, kitty! And it sat down blinking and flipping its tail. I stood there on the dark sidewalk for what seemed like minutes, just staring at this strange cat, when my sister grabbed the sleeve of my coat, yelling, Come on! I'm hungry and I'm cold! I looked in her direction, then looked back at the cat, and it was back on the wall. Feeling a bit silly that I was so startled by a cat, I looked at it and said, Well... You must be following us for a reason. What is it? Suddenly he got up, turned around and ran down the wall into the darkness. Not sure what had just happened, I shook my head and then started off at a run to catch up with my sister. We finally arrived at the pub, which was small, smoky, with the sound of Irish music filling the air. We enjoyed a nice hot bowl of soup with a sandwich. I had a couple of beers, and she had an Irish coffee, and we left feeling full and ready to return to our room to plan our next day's adventure. The temperature had dropped considerably since we arrived, so we started back to our B&B in double time, huddling our coats around us. As we went along, I gazed into each yard where I had seen this cat, and it wasn't there. So... It wasn't a lawn ornament, but a real feline following us after all. I half expected to see it at least once on our way back, but it never showed itself again. After returning to our B&B, we took our showers and retired to the drawing room to warm ourselves in front of the peak fire. 
While my sister was thumbing through the tour book, I picked up a book on Irish folklore that had been sitting on the table and began reading. Much to my surprise, there were stories about animal spirits that look over people. My mind went back to the cat, the strange colour I shine, how it showed up all over the place and how it reacted when I spoke to it. Could I have seen something supernatural? The next morning, during breakfast, I asked our host if she had a tortoiseshell cat, to which she replied she was allergic and couldn't have one. So, did anyone else in the neighbourhood have one? No, no one in the area had a cat with that description either. So, what was the cat I had seen? A stray in the neighbourhood, or was it a creature of law? I never mentioned to my sister how odd the encounter with this feline had been. She wouldn't have believed me anyway. For the remainder of our trip, whenever I saw a cat and could get near it, it was so disappointing when they always ran away. And I never again saw another tortoise shell either. Odd. A few months ago, I tuned into an internet radio programme that was all about myths and legends of Ireland with an Irish guest that had many paranormal experiences. During the programme I learned that one of the Gaelic names for fairy folk was Sidhe or She, and the experience I had with the cat in Ireland suddenly came to mind. So I decided to get into the programme's chat room and ask the guest if the Sidhe could be in animal form. The reply? Of course they can. I then described what the feline looked like, its odd behaviour and most importantly the strange eye shine. The guest didn't seem surprised at all that I had encountered one of the fairy folk and said that it knew to take the form of a being that I not only loved but felt comfortable enough to approach. I've been back to Ireland twice more and never again encountered anything like it. To this day, the vision of that gorgeous tortoiseshell cat with its strange golden blue eye shine is still a puzzle to me, but after having it validated that I could well have encountered a being of law, I still look at each of my own cat eyes in the dark, making sure that they are glowing the familiar green. Cheeky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keith Fox Dunham lives in Philadelphia with his wife Allison. He's a lymphoma survivor, cancer patient, modern bard and historian. His first book, The Street Martyr, was published by Gutter Book, a major motion picture based on the book is being produced by Throughline Films. Destroying the Tangible Illusion of Reality or Searching for Andy Kaufman, a book about what it's like to be dying of cancer, was recently released from Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing, and Fox has a story in the Stargate anthology, Points of Origin, from MGM and Fandemonium Books. Mercy was recently released by Bloodbound Books. Fox is an active member of the Harvard Association, he's been published in hundreds of short stories and articles, and his motto is Wrecking Civilization, One Story at a Time. Phil Thomas resides in the suburbs of Philadelphia and is an author and filmmaker. His screenplays have been produced into feature films such as False Face and Always From Darkness that are available in major retailers such as Best Buy and Target, as well as availability on Netflix and Amazon On Demand. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors.